3D Lab guest sessions are online technical talks or collaborative workshops with external practitioners or our in-house technical team. These sessions are hosted by the 3D Lab based at Wimbledon College of Arts, UAL. We seek conversations that reflect the richness of thinking through making, technical research and development, and practical learning and teaching. We aim to explore the making literacies that underpin making practice, and in doing so develop a learning resource within the context of performance and beyond. For previous sessions and to join our mailing list, please visit wca3dlab.myblog.arts.ac.uk. We're pleased to welcome Alexander Walmsley live from Berlin. Many thanks to Sarah Bias for organising this session today and to Alex for generously sharing his work with us. We talked to Alex about his recent project, Stardis 1620, the multiplicity of narrative in VR, the material research behind historical reconstruction and translating the physical world into an immersive digital environment. Alexander Wamsey is a virtual reality artist and developer specialising in the creation of immersive and interactive experiences for museums, architecture and other heritage and arts organisations. After academic studies in archaeology and anthropology, he became interested in VR as a way of creating and navigating 3D computer-generated environments for documentary and narrative purposes. He currently lives and works in Berlin and is also active as a research associate for VR and 3D visualization at the Hafen City University Hamburg. Brilliant, Alex. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, first of all, thank you to Ash and, and also to Sarah for inviting me along to speak um, about VR and also about this project I've been working on for the past year called um, Stada, Stada 1620. I am going to try and do this by a, a screen share here. So let me see if I can get quickly over to the presentation. So is the is that working for everyone? Yes, we can see that. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So yes. Um, as Ash said, I'm going to be talking in general about virtual environments, but in particular about um, how they work in virtual reality in particular, and also in particular how to get all the physical materials in the world, the sort of uh, in the world around us essentially into the virtual world, and how can we sort of reconfigure them and reuse them in order to create virtual environments. And then the second half will be more about uh, sort of how do we tell stories and how do, how do we structure narratives inside these environments. And actually at that point, I would quite like to take it, if, if possible, into a discussion because I know that quite a few people here have um, have a lot of experience and expertise out in sort of uh, stage design and telling stories in theatre, for example. And I think a lot of the concepts from there translate well into virtual reality. So hopefully there should be something interesting coming out of that as well. Um, but first of all, uh, the first question would be, what actually are virtual environments? Because I think people are coming from a, a variety of different backgrounds. One of the biggest, um, or one of the sort of most popular virtual environments would be those of video games. And so in the top left-hand corner there, that's, a, that's from a, quite a big blockbuster video game called Assassin's Creed. Um, these are generally massive open computer generated environments um, generally built by teams of hundreds of people um, mainly for, for video games so this is that's sort of really on the entertainment um, end of the spectrum but virtual environments are much broader than that so for example the, the middle one there the middle image is a medical simulation in vr um, where in particular, it's used quite a bit in surgery now that you can train surgeons in virtual reality by allowing them to manipulate tools with the controllers on a sort of virtual patient, essentially. Um, also in that same vein, but perhaps a quite a different application is military simulations. And in the middle image on the right, there's, a, there's an example of one of these military environments that, um, that are used for training. Um, perhaps another quite popular um, example of virtual environment is, is uh, social networks and social environments. So for example, Second Life, which was, it's not so big now, but it was big in the sort of 90s and 2000s, 
um, was essentially a massive virtual environment where people can go in and interact with others and sort of form this virtual world um, in the same way that we do on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever. In fact, Facebook, which is the, the middle image on the bottom, has their own virtual reality um, social environment now. And it looks quite, well, it looks extremely dystopian actually, but, um, but they are sort of going into that market headfirst now. Al alongside that, there are, again, quite a few other examples. So architecture visualization is a big one where you find virtual environments. Um, virtual environments are found a lot in fine art nowadays as well. So it's a big, it's a big spectrum of what counts as a virtual environment. The second question to start us off is virtual reality. And I, I, I imagine quite a few people have had experience with virtual reality or at least know what it is, but I would give a, a very high level definition of it as a way of navigating and experience virtual environments that the body's movements onto corresponding movements in the virtual world. Um, the way I quite like to describe it is similarly to a, a scuba diving outfit or something that allows you to experience underwater worlds. I would say on a very high level virtual reality does the same thing but for computer generated worlds. Um, however, in practice, it's it generally when people refer to virtual reality, it refers to the very specific technology um, that is one of these head mounted displays that you probably all know because they can look ridiculous. Um, and come from a number of different companies. So HTC is a big one. Oculus is another big name that, that comes up a lot. Um, the headsets, as well as your hand controllers, are tracked in a 3D space. So usually when you use virtual reality, you have a two meter by two meter space on the ground um, where you can walk around and these two mounted lasers on the walls can track you track all your movements in 3D space and map them into the virtual environment. More and more, actually, you have not just the headset and controllers, but they're developing now haptic feedback suits. That is uh, sort of full body suits that you wear, much like a motion capture suit that can track all your movements and then translate them into the virtual space. So that's coming up now. They cost a few thousand pounds, so I don't think many people have them, but that is probably, I would have thought, in the next five to ten years, what we're, what, what the direction that we're going in. The final thing, which is quite important for virtual reality, is uh, a game engine. And this is the piece of software that will run on your computer. It's called a game engine because traditionally these things were and continue to be developed by video game companies. But all they are, they've been used for decades now, all they are are um, a sort of development environment for building simulations, whether they be 2D simulations or, as we'll talk about, 3D simulations of a 3D world. And they are able to simulate, for example, the way that light bounces off a surface, the way that gravity affects objects. Um, everything really that makes up the real world can be simulated in these, um, in these game engines. Um, and in particular, the project that I'll be talking about is this project called Stada 1620. It, uh, the town of Stada is, the, uh, is where it's based on. It's a town near Hamburg in northern Germany on the River Elbe. And it, the reason 1620 is important is, uh, well, for two reasons. First of all, um, Stade, as well as Hamburg, as well as quite a few of these other northern German, southern Swedish, uh, Baltic states, essentially, or Baltic city-states, were all part of this Hanseatic League of Cities, sort of developing in the late medieval period and going up to the early modern period, or the sort of 16th, 17th century. Um, these were all very powerful towns in a network and 1620s about at the, because it's the beginning of the, the 30 years war, which in Europe really was a, was a game changer for the geopolitical situation. This is a sort of point at which the, um, the balance of power changed. So it's a bit of a interesting year to, to look at the city essentially, not only from a architectural point of view, but also from a political point of view. And this was to be installed as in the, version of this VR um, installation was to be installed in the museum in Stade in May but unfortunately that hasn't happened because it's uh, as of yet still closed so it'll probably be hopefully be going in later this year and we'll be able to at least do some preliminary testing of it but yes so this is the I'll go through over the course of this a uh, 
um, how we built this environment and a little bit about the storytelling in it. Um, just first of all, though, I can give you very quickly a video of a trailer that I made essentially a few months ago, um, or even last year, of, um, of the experience. And hopefully this should work. Let's have a go. I realize actually you're probably not getting the sound on this, but that's all right. But um, it's just to give you an idea of really the visual, what it, what it looks like visually. So I'll just let it run for a bit. So that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of what it actually looks like or indeed looked like because that video is a little bit old now and it was before I added any sort of people or animals or any, any of the things that bring the experience actually alive. But visually it's still, it's still more or less uh, looks like that or the architecture is still like that. Um, so yes, the, the two questions, uh, what are the physical materials, that is what were the sort of, um, what materials did I take from the real world and try and bring them over into, into the virtual world to create something that is, uh, you know, that has its basis in all these, uh, in all these real materials, um, but that is, uh, that can be navigated in virtual reality. And then secondly, of course, how do you approach narrative and storytelling in such an environment? I think much like with drawing or etching in when you're creating a, a large virtual environment, especially one that is it's particularly large like, like Stada, is that you want to start with the very sort of blocking out the big shapes essentially. And in this case, the big shapes are the landscape itself and the individual buildings. So the first technique that um, was used in order to get all this information into the virtual world is called photogrammetry. And uh, I think this is, is, I wouldn't be surprised if quite a lot of people have already heard of it, but I will um, do a little bit of an explanation. It's basically a technique of being able to generate 3D models from hundreds and hundreds of 2D photographs. Now, the other reason we did this model was in 1620 is because we very uh, fortuitously had a 3D model of the town in 1620 already in the collections of the museum. Now, this was a model made in, in the 1970s sometime and they had lost, A, they didn't know who had actually made it and B, they didn't actually know what sources the person had used to make it. So we didn't want to use it as a, we didn't simply want to copy it over into the virtual world, but actually just use it as a basis for getting all the, um, all the sort of, uh, placements of the houses and stuff. And so what we did is we went to the, uh, went to Stad, took hundreds and hundreds of photographs from different angles of this 3D model. And then you, it can run an algorithm that essentially selects hundreds of thousands of points on these photographs. All these points are 
create a, what's called a dense point cloud. And then the program that you're using, the algorithm, can then go through and triangulate each one of these points, or each three of these points together into a triangle. And once you've triangulated all the points, then you have this 3D mesh. And once you have the 3D mesh, then you can manipulate it as you would a 3D model in a digital program. So um, uh, I personally use a, a 3D program called Blender, but there's, there's many others. I don't know if, if people use them regularly, but Maya, for example, 3ds Max. These are all programs that can be used then to, to manipulate a point cloud. Um, so once you have this 3D model, um, I had all, uh, all the information really apart from the landscape to get started. Then the second, the way I got the very broad landscape, the surrounding landscape was essentially through satellite imagery. So you can use, there's, there's a huge databases, databases full of publicly available satellite imagery taken from particularly this one uh, satellite mission called the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission that uh, measures every 30 meters around the Earth, the height. From that, it creates what's called a digital elevation model. And that is what you see on the right there is essentially this uh, black and white image. It doesn't look like much, but this is actually um, the area surrounding Stade in northern Germany. Um, and it comes out as a black and white image, but what you can do is you can use it then as what's called a displacement map. And this is essentially when you have a, a 3D program, you have a plane, a, a flat 2D plane. Using a displacement map, you can displace each part of the plane relative to the height of the land in this image. So it's a really quite sort of quick and effective way of getting over real life topography into a game engine or into a 3D program and then from the 3D program into the game engine. Um, so by this point you have essentially the two ingredients that you need to start blocking out the environment. So the first is you bring in the landscape into this game engine. What the, these two images are now taken from within the game engine. Right? The top left hand one is you see this was a quite a um, time uh, costly stage, which was going through the model, uh, sorry, going through this photogrammetry model. And for each of the houses in the photogrammetry model, I created a small sort of placeholder mesh. That is, I said, I modeled a very simple house shape and put it in the place the house was in the photogrammetry mesh. I did that for all the houses and I think in total there are 954 uh, houses in this model. So for each one I had to place one of these low, low polygon meshes. Then also for the walls, of course, so you can see in the bigger photos, you see all these gray elements along the front are part of the defensive wall. You can also see there are, I think, eight different churches that, um, that some of which still exist in the town today that would, I knew in the future, would need to be modeled by hand individually. Um, there are a few other elements, so in this one as well, you see trees. They, they are all as well modeled by hand. So this is really where it takes um, a lot of, you know, it's a, it takes a lot of time at this stage, the first bit, to, to get to that all in place. Um, but once you have that in place, it is more or less, that, that's really the, I would say, the most time costly part of the process, because at this stage, once you have this, it is simply a, a not simply it is a the idea is to simply reiterate this model making it more and more complex adding more and more detail until you have something that you're happy with and also something that runs in virtual reality so the next step really is this adding of detail and um, this is where it was important to go to Stade and also some other towns in the area see so i also um, spent a bit of time in Lübeck, which is another town in northern Germany, another one of these uh, uh, Hans former Hanseatic League cities, uh, with similar architecture, and take a as many reference photos as possible. So, and especially of these nice architectural elements that I thought I could bring in later into the environment. So, you have a lot of this beautiful brickwork, for example, uh, some of the iron decorations next to the big church window there. 
you have this, this sort of half moon crescent shape on the on the wooden beam at the bottom and a lot of the other sort of woodwork which is uh, quite distinctive of buildings of this time and um, and I really wanted to bring into the virtual environment to make it feel detailed and immersive. So you can use, of course, uh, these photos are important as reference material, but furthermore, they're also important because you can take textures directly from photos, which is extremely useful. So you can, so a lot of these photos, and I'll show you how that works uh, in a second. You can take, for example, the bottom left-hand image. You have this uh, sort of brickwork that you can, that I can, in Photoshop, chop down and make into what's called a tileable texture. That is a texture essentially when I stack it up side by side, which I would want to do over uh, over a 3D model. You can't see where one ends and one begins and the other begins. Um, so as I said, this once you've got these low poly models in place, you can just reiterate and add more detail. So the first step is then to add in more detailed 3D models. Um, and essentially, you just want to go over those. And you need to get to a point where it looks realistic enough, but you can't. The, the difficulty with virtual reality is that it's extremely uh, technologically, it has a lot of technological constraints. If you go too high, if you go too complicated with too much detail, uh, what ends up happening is that the frame rate in the game engine goes too low and uh, it makes for a very uncomfortable VR experience. So you want to get it to the level where it's looking realistic um, and because you need to experience all these things at one to one scale. So you need to, in virtual reality, go up to a, go right up to a building in, to, in order to be able to see it so or to inspect it. But not beyond that. The, um, that polygon count, as they call it. But the way you can make something much more detailed without actually adding any more polygons is through the use of these texture maps. Um, these basically allow the game engine to calculate how light should interact with um, a surface um, at its most basic form. And in particular, there are a number of maps that are important to do this. So the first one of these is called the diffuse map. The diffuse map is simply gives all the color uh, information and what you're seeing here is essentially the all the textures on a 2d plane which are then wrapped around the model in a way that you specify within the 3d program so you can sort of you can see uh, all the windows in the top right hand corner for example and the big walls are down at the bottom um, these are all because the game engine will take it and project it onto the surface that i've uh, that I've told it to project it onto. So you can get all these, that's how you get all these textures onto the 3D model. The next one along is the normal map, which is um, a really important map in order to make this model look more detailed than, than it otherwise would. The normal map essentially allows, uh, allows the game engine to calculate how a, how light, how the shadows should fall essentially on the, um, on the 3D model. It, very specifically says that some pixels are facing upwards and some some pixels are facing downwards um, and so the light when you go up if you're if you have a, a brick wall for instance and on a 3d model that's just a flat 2d plane a normal map will will make the plane look like it has bricks coming out of it for example some bricks are coming further out than others and the light will react by actually um, by actually calculating the shadows that the brick leaves behind, even though it's just a flat 2D plane. That, I don't know if that makes sense, but I will be able to show that later, so hopefully it should make more sense then. The other maps there, the ambient occlusion and roughness maps, those are just extra maps that even in, that allow the game engine to calculate in even more detail and more um, specificity how the light should interact with the surface. Um, but the important thing to take away is just that these, there are a number of texture maps that have to be, that can really augment the model and make it look realistic and that you can do this from 2D photos um, in Photoshop, essentially. So the next step then is, as I said, to like reiterate over this low polygon model, first by making high polygon versions, that is more detailed versions of 
um, of the houses in the town and of the walls and of all the other elements. So in order to do this, part, part of it was done by reference to the reference photos. A lot of it was done by reference to paintings of the time. And I ended up relying a lot on painters of sort of golden age um, Dutch and Netherlands painters because they're really the closest point of reference to Stade. And so a lot of these houses sort of have a, a bit of a reminiscent feel of, of the Netherlands in that period, but the architecture is actually is, is fairly similar. Um, and also, of course, the ships, um, because Sharda, of course, is a, a Hanseatic town with a big uh, shipping industry. And so elements like ships and the crane that you see in the bottom right hand corner there, a shipping crane, um, those are all things that, well, they, they exist. They, I was able to take reference photos of them. So there are there is still a shipping crane in Stade that you can go see. And, um, and I essentially modeled that directly based on that shipping crane in the town um, where it is today. So you can reiterate over this model many times until you essentially have, um, you keep doing this and this process took, uh, I would say three to four months, but you eventually come up with, that's how you get to this, this, in this virtual environment. It still doesn't have any people in it. It still doesn't have any animals or interactions. It's just the virtual environment, but it is ready to add all those extra elements. Um, you can also see here all the a number of churches, the, some of the spires there. Those, most of those are churches that also exist in the town today. So I was able to take reference photos directly from that and essentially model them based on those reference photos and also a few architectural plans that were available. Um, but most of the buildings you see are a variation of about 13 different base houses, I would say. So I said before there were 954 individual buildings and that is true, but in order to get to that, I didn't have to model 954 individual houses. I was able to model 13 and then essentially copy and paste while making minor changes to them throughout the entire environment. And by doing that, not only does it save on, on production time, but it also means that you can come up with a quite a rich and diverse environment um, with less effort than you would otherwise do if you were modeling every single house. Um, and then I won't, I will only touch on this because um, this is really not my area of expertise, I'm afraid, but the um, modeling people and animals and um, sort of adding life to this was the next step that took also about, I'd say two to three months, maybe four months. Um, and it's really, it, it's, it's, an, it's a bit of a, it's a completely different area from modeling and architecture. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm a bit of an amateur in this, but it was important to, to some, to give some life to this environment. <laughs> Hopefully that will be continued further, but it's essentially the same process. So I had um, some good reference images, particularly from one good book I was able to find about um, on sort of peasant and folk costumes from this period, and also from this website that, that I put there. And I essentially modeled clothes for these characters based on these reference images. Um, then, of course, the next step is to is to animate these characters and you can animate that. I've animated them in, in a number of different positions. Walking, for example, is the main one. There are three different walks that if you go into this environment that you'll be able to see people walking around. Um, there are also areas where people are in conversation. So I did a few conversation animations. And then there are a few other things where people are interacting with animals, for example, and those are separate animations in themselves. So altogether, I would say, I think there are about eight or nine different animations that, and about 450 people in this environment, but they are in the same way that the houses were copy and pasted with minor changes. A lot of the people are indeed copies of one sort of original person with minor additions made or minor subtractions made in order to make them look more individual. Um, the animals, luckily, I didn't have to model. So the animals I, um, I bought from a, an online store that allows you to, to buy game assets for, 
for these sorts of things. So luckily, th those were already available, or else that would have been quite a lot. Of, that would have been a few months extra to do those. Um, but yeah, on top of this, it's it's essentially um, you can keep iterating over that for as long as you like. Um, you know, you can you, you can go on for months and months just adding more and more detail. Um, there is one more thing that's quite important, which is uh, audio, and it's actually extremely important, and it's not something I have spent too much time on at this point, but it's going to be, a, I would say, a big part of the next step. Um, the, these are all from field recordings. These are all field recordings that I use to, to, put, into the, um, to put into the environment, and in many places within the virtual environment, I was able to layer up sounds so that you, get quite a, you can get quite a complex atmosphere, atmospheric sounds from just um, piling up a few of these of these clips so i think hopefully if i'm able to uh, i think i'm gonna have to take my headphones off and play this quickly so this is a barrel rolling down the street So um, hopefully there's no echo on the, uh, on the recording now. Um, yes, yeah, so essentially you layer up these recordings. You can get, it's quite nice because you can get, um, you can then add a lot of narrative elements into this landscape that I would otherwise need to model and animate myself. So the idea of a barrel, of somebody rolling a barrel down the street, which is really quite a complicated thing to, to model and animate. I can get that narrative element in simply by adding all particular place within the environment, similar with church bells and the harbour atmosphere there. The, so yes, the second, so, so after you've got all these elements, the next bit is really adding, adding in the virtual reality uh, interactions. And this is actually the first time that I'm going to talk about virtual reality now. So um, there are, it's, and this will lead on to the storytelling bit, really. The, one of the big difficulties of virtual reality, one of the big problems to be solved, and people are working on it, is how do you move in virtual reality? It seems like quite an easy question, in, but it's not intuitive because of the problem of uh, VR motion sickness. Motion sickness, it's exactly the same as with motion sickness in a car or a, or a ferry, for example. It derives from the fact that your mind um, feels like it's moving in the virtual environment, but your body um, is static and it's not moving. And so when it, similarly, similarly to a car, for example, when you see the landscape going by, but your body doesn't feel like it's moving, that's the sort of car motion sickness. It's the same thing really with, um, with, with VR motion sickness. And to get around this, the, at the moment, there's only really there's only really a few solutions, but one of them is this mechanic that I'm, that is right here I'm showing you now is um, the teleportation mechanic, whereby you essentially put, you have a controller, you're able to point to an uh, area on the ground, and you then click a button and you will teleport there. So the screen goes blank for a second, and um, and you teleport to that location. Um, it doesn't seem intuitive because obviously that's not how humans move, but actually it's much better than the alternative really, which is to get a, a controller, a game controller, for example, and move with a joystick or a thumbstick, which would cause you to glide through the environment. Turns out for most people, that is really what causes this motion sickness. And if you use this teleportation mechanic, it's a nice way of getting around that. Um, it also allows you to move large environments very quickly, which is obviously good for that's here. Um, actually, I probably won't. This I was going to show a video here, which is just of that tele teleportation mechanic in action. But I think I'll probably just um, move on to the next one because I want to get onto the storytelling thing. And um, the another element that we that into this environment was um, what's nice about Stada is that it the town plan is very similar to um, as in 1620 as it is to today. So I had this idea of putting in these little, these little pink circles, essentially, 
Each one of these, there are about 22 within the virtual environment, are where you can walk in and by clicking a button, you can be transported into a 360 degree photograph of the same place in contemporary Stada. So you can, obviously the, the, if the street layout has remained the same, but the buildings around it are different. So it's a nice way of allowing people to um, compare between the modern town and then the town in 1620. Um, there are also a number of information forms throughout the town um, where of, of buildings that are interesting or that still exist today and people can go up to them and um, click on one of these information points and read through. Uh, another, another issue that I won't talk about, but the, um, the issue of getting text into a 3D world is very difficult because 3D lettering is, is notoriously difficult to read. So the best way really is so far is to, is to get a, one of these billboards in and just put text on it. But it's something to consider when you're building these virtual environments at least. And then the last thing that we like, put in after we had a few people over from Stada to test it out was a, an actual interactive map that you can, you can zoom in and out of and you can tell where you are in the virtual town, which turned out to be um, quite an important point I guess quite intuitively for people from Stada who were going around the virtual version and had no idea where they were. So I put this um, sort of little interactive map on where you, you hold it on one controller and you can use your other one to to interact with it. Um, so now on to the storytelling and hopefully I, I'm hoping that we've been able to have a little bit of a discussion or at least some questions and answers about this because I would be very, I'm, this is another thing in V that is by no means a, a finished debate and there are a lot of interesting solutions that people have to how to tell stories but um, there's a lot of room for, for creativity and for research in that area for sure. Um, I think one of the big challenges is really the, this lack of frame or indeed at least a frame, a lack of a frame as we know it from cinema, theatre, video games, photography for example. In, in all of these media, um, you know, in cinema, it's the, it's the screen, in video games, it's also the screen, in photography, it's the, the viewfinder of the frame, and theatre, it's the stage. These are, um, these are all ways of directing attention of the audience onto the action that's happening, onto the plot. The problem in virtual reality is that there is, we don't have this frame, or at least by putting on the goggles, the VR goggles, you are within the frame. And there is no, there are some tricks you can use to get people to look at the action you want them to look at, but there's no fail safe way of doing it where you can really direct people's attention at, uh, at a piece of plot that's unfolding. So if you have people, for example, talking in one, or if you have action of people talking in one part of the virtual environment, you cannot guarantee that the person is gonna be looking in that direction when you, um, when you want them to. And this essentially leads to uh, a, a big lack of control of narrative in a, in a virtual reality world because you do not have control over where the audience is looking. Um, this also leads to a corresponding lack of linearity in the narrative. Also, I, as I was saying in a second, there are examples of, of VR works that use a linear narrative. I think there might be other interesting solutions to that. And then of course, these technical challenges. So one is VR motion sickness, which I've already mentioned. The other is this awareness of the external environment. Um, it's, you can find a lot of YouTube videos of people who are so immersed in the virtual environment that they forget almost that they have a physical body as well. And this is also played up, played up by virtual reality experiences. So there's a famous one, a few years old now, I think. Um, I think it's called the Plank Experience. Um, where you, in a virtual environment, you're on top of a building and there's a plank over the side of the building and you have to walk along the plank and then jump off and then it's the next person's go. Um, and there are YouTube videos of people experiencing this VR um, experience and they'll get to the end of the plank in the virtual world and simply not be able to go any further. They won't be able to jump even though they'll only be jumping 10 centimeters in front of them onto the carpet they're you know physically unable to do it um that's quite an extreme example of that but you know you have to how do you make people aware of their external environment um you know so that can also simply be 
how do you make them comfortable? Because they're, they're not able to, some people are quite uncomfortable if they're unable to see their, what's around them in real life. And so you have to find a way of sort of bringing people softly or easily into this virtual world. Um, so the solutions, I'll quickly um, compare these two groups and these are two very broad groups that I've made. It's not to say that these are all, there are only two types of these narratives, but the first one important for VR, I would say, is this linear narrative and it's closely related uh, friends, the, the forking narrative. And this is where the player will follow a plot or the author or audience or reader or whatever that will follow a plot created for them by the author and designer. And in a forking narrative, they may be given a choice to follow one of multiple storylines. Um, and it's one that's seen not often in novels, films, and theater. And in VR, it's seen, there are these two examples I've brought up here. Um, one is Notes on Blindness, which is a, a really, really lovely VR experience based on the diaries of, a Ameri of an American philosopher, I believe, I forgot his name, um, but who went blind later in life and kept a diary of it. And it works essentially by there are a series of virtual environments that you move through in VR. Each one corresponds to one entry in the diary. So it's it's a it followed because the diary has this linear narrative. It's it works quite well to just translate that straight into virtual reality. Um, the other one there is called Half Life Alex. That's a that's a video game that was recently released. Um, that also follows quite a linear narrative. The way they do that is um, they borrow a lot the game environment techniques, which essentially are quite a clever way of produce, of making these virtual environments whereby there is really only one way you can follow it through. Um, but it gives you the impression as if you're in this big open environment, but really that you, you follow a pretty set path and that allows them to add in plot points here and there and they know that the player will eventually find them. Um, the second category here, which is I think what I'm going to move forward with um, forward with in, in Stada, um is this nonlinear and emergent category whereby a player does not follow a direct causal line between the events and the plot. And um, the narrative really emerges within the context of uh, the environment and the player following a set of rules. It's one that's seen a lot in board games, uh, for example. In fact, in, in pretty much all board games, this is the, the mechanic, the narrative is not what the author gives, but more what the interactions between the players as the game goes on. Also in, in live action um, role playing games, for example, sometimes in video games and, and often in theater as well, you'll see these non-linear and emergent narratives. Um, in virtual reality, the, the one I'd point to is called Anne Frank House VR, which is, again, like Stade, it's based on a historical reconstruction of, um, of the, this time of the Anne Frank House in, in Amsterdam. And it just allows the player to, to go around the house, pick up objects, and each object sort of tells a story. And there's no there's no pushing the player towards one object or another. They are sort of able to just um, experience it at their own pace. And at the end, when I did it, at least, you get quite a nice um, history, not only of of, um, of the house itself, but also of, of Anne Frank. So it it is a that it can be very effective, I think, in a in these non-linear and emergent narratives, I think particularly for VR, where you give up that, that control of the narrative. Um, that is all I had, but I would be, um, let me go back. Um, really? Yeah, I would be interested. I don't know. I, I don't know. If, obviously, I'd be happy to take any questions, but also if people are interested in having a discussion about, um, about sort of narrative in VR, especially, you know, if people have experience with theatre uh, mm. and stuff like that. Well, thanks so much, Alex. Um, that's brilliant and so good to touch upon the technical aspects as well. And is really where we're situating these discussions is just, yes, how do we how do we engage in these platforms and these tools um, uh, for their purposes, but then also to really have a, a sort of perspective of like what's actually involved, you know? But it was amazing yeah. even just to understand a bit of the layered forms and like how basically the time scale that 
have, it's taken you to kind of develop those different stages. We have a quick fire question from Dick Straker a while back, which he was just asking about the global topography mapping. Um, is that publicly available? Or yeah, so the, um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of different satellites, satellite data that you can get. The one I was using there is called the SRTM data. So shuttle radar topography mission. That's one mission. Can't remember who it was who it was run by, but yes, it's it's all publicly available data. There are a number of places on the internet where you can just download it in bulk. Um, but the place that I use is, is, a, is a website called OpenTopography.com. Um, it's just a platform that allows you to sort of select an area and then download all the data for that area essentially. Great. And another quick fire question was just, uh, what engine are you using and how did you make the selection? Um, this engine is Unreal Engine. Um, I think in, in realistically, I mean, there are a few engines, but realistically the choice was between two, Unreal Engine and the other one was Unity. Um, more or less because those are the ones, they are first of all publicly and freely available if the, um, if the revenue is under 100,000. So, for, for all museum applications, that's fine. You don't need to pay for it. Um, it's also, they've also got really good and big communities. And as will definitely happen in development, you have a question, they have big forums where you can uh, go on and um, simply ask the question. You'll usually get a response pretty quickly. And they also have very good documentation for that. So I was at Unreal Engine. I mean, Unreal Engine also is it, more techn technically is, I find if you're aiming for photorealistic environments, it tends to have more tools that support that. Whereas Unity is, is a great engine as well, and it's somewhat easier, more intuitive to use, but the rendering capabilities, I would say, is not quite as powerful maybe as Unreal Engine. Um, before we potentially do a deep dive into just thinking a bit more about the narrative and the story uh, impl uh, implications of VR, um, the, Jonathan's just asked about your background, really, um, and, and just asks where you situate your practice. And I, I think what we find so interesting is that you've got multiple, there's, there's almost a multiplicity of how you're approaching um, using uh, VR as a tool, just because mm. of your background. Um, and so Jonathan just asked, where do, you, where do you find that you situate your practice academically, professionally? Um, you have called yourself a, VI, a VR artist and developer, but he asks, mm. you know, is it artist, designer, historian, researcher? Do you find these are helpful yeah. kind of delineations or yeah, how, do you, I, how do you approach it? I think it's quite difficult because, um, um, first of all, because it, it is quite a new area and there are people, there's, there's very few people that will have formal education in virtual reality. I know there are a few accredited courses. There are, I don't think there are any in Germany, though, for example, but I know there are a few in the UK, um, VR accredited courses. But um, so I, I think everyone that comes from VR, most people will come at it from a diagonal point of view. The way I came at it was indeed from uh, I studied archaeology um, at, under, at undergraduate and then at, at master's. Um, I. I mean, I sort of took a sidestep because I found, first of all, virtu these virtual tools, not just virtual reality, um, but the sort of tools that are used in game design, really interesting, um, not particularly for game design, but for simulation of, of environments, for environment creation. And so for me, the, the, the most pertinent way to apply that to what I was doing previously was through historic environments. And so I, I, I wouldn't, call myself a researcher at all because I, I don't I simply don't do any research really um, except for a bit of design research and how to in virtual reality interfaces how best to, to apply these sort of uh, teleportation um, I think my background in archaeology I'm quite interested for example for certainly in historical environments um, but I think more widely I would say um, for me are uh, environments that either do not exist anymore or that are sort of somehow speculative or imaginary or something, which is also a very archaeological approach because archaeology is essentially trying to recreate environments from from, um, from a very few material traces. 
I think in the same way, these, these things are interesting. The same questions are applicable to architecture, for example, which I also find interesting. Um, Dick uh, has picked up, you know, this, 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 this question of um, our perception so rapidly perceives the faux reality of VR. Um, mm. And he sort of asks, what developments, devices, tricks can alleviate this and how can the illusion be improved? And I think you touched upon a little bit about embracing them almost the multiplicity of the yeah. space and the opportunities for narrative that that creates. That, um, but you also touched on the brilliant example of Zelda uh, and the Planck um, mm. experience. Uh, and so there's, there's a real kind of uh, seesaw effect between people having massive buy-in and yeah. believing, believing this is something that they, it's a world they can trust and implicitly engage. And then also that kind of tipping the scale of actually it does it potentially our brain is still computing it as maybe a cartoon environment um i just wondered mm. if you had um a little bit more to say on 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 just like i guess the hyper reality side of, of vr mm. Mm. i i think it's interesting because um so especially especially with this project um and have a few other people working in the museum industry about virtual reality, there's a, the, the, the main sort of skepticism comes from the fact that it cuts you off completely from, from the outside world. And it, the immersiveness in that sense is seen more as a threat to, um, to the museum narrative than an advantage. I think, um, I think realistically, immersiveness is virtual reality's strongest card, essentially, especially when you compare it to something like augmented reality, which is, uh, you know, based on a on a, on a smartphone or a tablet or whatever with a camera um, that has certain advantages but I think virtual reality is really the, the, the strongest card is this immersiveness and I think the best way to approach it is simply to embrace it and I think that there is this problem um, of making people comfortable in, in their environment and aware and it sounds weird but aware that they still have a physical body um, and I think the, the best ones I've seen and I think probably the best way of approaching it is by thinking not just of the virtual environment as a sort of cut off thing, but having some sort of um, like installation space around you that sort of prepares people to move into that virtual space. So um, instead of just setting it up in a room, um, a normal museum gallery, for example, or a, um, I don't know where else, instead of your living room, you would have um, something that guides you in. So that could be, I've seen it where it's like, uh, just be posters, for example. I mean, that would be a very simple, not very imaginative way of guiding people in, but at least it gives them some sort of warning of what they're about to go into. Um, I've also seen it where people make whole like little boxes where people can go in, put the headset on, and then they're in this sort of physical space that is cut off from the world before they put on the on the virtual goggles and it sort of a way of preparing you for that for that immersiveness and also that isolation that's the other the flip yeah. side of immersion I, I think i think james james picks up on that because he you know his question was uh, or maybe suggestion is uh, you know can there be an interplay between the physical world in which the vr is, is experienced and the vr itself um, yeah you know and in in terms of a layered narrative and actually that's potentially what's what's interesting in a theater context in the sense mm. of you know, uh, you, you'd layer in theatre real act actors playing uh, Im uh, imagined performers who are playing characters kind of thing. Yes, I've, I've, um, that reminds me of one thing that I didn't see personally, but I, I heard of, um, I think it was in Germany, that um, it was a theatre company that was doing a virtual reality play and they had it such, it was a two person play, the person, one person, the audience member that was in the virtual reality headset and then just one other person and who was playing, I think, their mother or their grandmother or something. And the experience was that you put the headset on, you played the part of a child, and this actor played the part of their mother or grandmother, and you had to go through the play, and they were represented then by a digital avatar in the real world. But all throughout the play, the person in the physical world did the exact same motions as the person in the virtual world. So it was really like they were mapping retrospectively mapping their actions onto the virtual world that sounds like a 
extremely difficult thing to do, but um, but it has been done. Uh, and, and yeah, and difficult to predict in some shapes mm. know, if 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 uh, we take into account the multiplicity of narrative. Um, mm. James also says, uh, you know, like, which is an interesting one, it, you know, does your technical process, so for instance, the, the creation of the world, inform the sense of what the narrative narrative will be? Or do you start with a story in mind, but, you know, like, yeah. which, uh, it, what's the integration like between those two things? Yeah, it depends a lot on the project. I th th this project, the way it was structured, is that it was initially intended just to be the virtual environment so it was essentially a, a contracting thing i worked for six months just on this virtual environment it was only after that and um, that they decided they wanted to do a more storytelling aspect of it it was also important obviously i think that this is a historical reconstruction and that the virtual reality experience is essentially um it is an it is an object in itself. It is based on museum collections and it is sort of, um, it wasn't, it is an interpretation of the collections, but it's really meant to stand on its own as a, um, as a thing. So I think normally it would make sense to start with a narrative and only do the, the work that makes sense for that narrative. And also, you know, that allows you to experiment a bit more with how you construct an environment. And for the most part, I would say that's how these things are made that's certainly how video games are made mm -hmm. um in this case it was like different just because of that historical aspect that they wanted to make accurate and, and sort of believable yeah and i guess in some senses the medium is a message here mm. in some shape or form um chloe you touched upon that like um creating uh people and the you know the sort of animating of it necessarily in the kind of people uh, and animals um, that that potentially wasn't your speciality but um, mm -hmm. she uh, uh, Chloe asks um, uh, she's interested in uh, how textiles uh, could be used interactively in VR mm -hmm. have you thought about including different textiles in your worlds um, so I know that's not potentially uh, your area but I guess textiles you're using everywhere in terms of you know the brickwork and all of that sort of thing as well yeah, absolutely. I think um, so with the people, especially the clothes that they're wearing, the um, it is the case essentially that you need to model those clothes. You need to go into a 3D modeling program and just push push the, the vertices around until you get something that looks like that. Essentially. But um, there are, of course, a number of good tools that can help you in, in a lot of these 3D programs. There are um, simulation algorithms that allow you to um, simulate the fall of a cloth over something. And so that's essentially how I put all the clothes on these people is I model the person and then I um, simulated the effect of a shirt falling over them, which is how you get the sort of realistic um, fall of a cloth on a shoulder, for example, and anywhere on the body is that this is simulated. Then you can go in and make minor adjustments afterwards. In order to get, and you can then change those parameters if you have a heavier cloth, cloth, if you have something like canvas, you can change the parameters to make it heavier compared to if you had silk. Um, yeah, that's the basic process of doing that, yeah. Um, we have some costume students and technicians in the call, oh. and um, oh. Hester Woodward is our costume technician, and she's put marvelousdesigner.com modeling class. Yes. So, Yes. Um, so you, I guess you must know about that. Yeah. Um, I'm just picking up. Um, I'm aware we um, are coming to the end of our time, but um, we could definitely go on for ages because I just think there's so much to unpack um, on the technical aspects as well as um, just in the narrative side. I think both of them are so fascinating. Um, uh, you know, maybe there's another way that we can um, continue the discussion. Um, uh, Nick Bailey, just in, in terms of our um, talking about uh, the uh, the real versus the digital experience, he was just saying the difference between narrative immersion and sensory immersion. Um, mm. And he finds very graphically based VR is sensory immersive, even if you know it's not reality mm. intellectually. 
So that's interesting as well that actually when we when we think of things that might be faux reality like it Straka men mentioned mm -hmm. that actually there's something happening in your mind because of the kind of uh, the immersive environment. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, I, th I just I guess wrapping up in some senses um, George has just asked um, would you ever release um, status 1620 to the general public either in vr or non-vr uh, mm. there seems to be so much detail would be nice to explore from the comfort of your own home without any time constraints yeah this was um we discussed with the museum of potentially once once we add in these storytelling elements of taking it around to festivals potentially um there's not any plan it's sort of difficult to release it for general public it's definitely possible I would say it's definitely a possibility, yes, um, but it's difficult to find the right the right platform for doing that because there are certainly video game platforms that allow you to do that. But um, because this is not a it's not a for profit project, um, a lot of these platforms um, cost to to put your stuff on there. Otherwise, the only other way would be to make it available downloaded from a website, which is certainly a possibility. But um, um, it's not something that that I've talked about with the museum yet. Um, just our festivals. Um, Alex, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time and your generosity in putting this together for us today. Um, it's just been amazing to just look into your process. Um, I'm just I'm fascinated about um, how you're gathering your information, your technical side. Um, you know, as a trained archaeologist and interest in architecture, and then now designer and actually putting things together. There's this wonderful like seamless link in using all these things to, uh, for, to create. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I hope we can stay in a network together um, and potentially continue the conversation in, in some way. Um, please do update us if um, things do go online so uh, we could share that out for you. I'm sure yeah. we'd be really interested. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, so. Yeah, well, look at all these comments. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, incredibly inspiring, says Nick. So there you go. Amazing work, says George. Best of luck. So uh, yeah, I think it's unanimous that um, it's just brilliant to have an insight. So thank you so much.